So yeah, I hadn't really thought a lot about the possibility of eliminating predation altogether between animals. And so you raise the interesting example, David, of um, where it's part of the flourishing of a cat to play with a mouse uh, for sport and for fun. And yet, pretty clearly, uh, that um, is not, you know, to be played with like that is not part of the flourishing um, of a life for a mouse. And so this question about, well, who's flourishing ought to win or to trump you know, the other. And um, it, it's not really a question I've thought of a lot in that context. Um, you know, one way of going might be to think of there being almost hierarchies of sort of flourishing lives. And, um, you know, there's some sort of reason to think about it this way, but I suppose the idea would be that, you know, the life of a creature that can, you know, flourish in a maybe deeper way or a more sophisticated way um, somehow is more important than the life of a creature that can't do that um, or a species that can't do that. I mean, I'm wary of endorsing this, but I, I suppose if you think about this from the perspective of a human being and someone who's you know, pregnant, suppose this is another thought experiment we could talk about uh, that might be illuminating. Um, you know, suppose um, someone was pregnant and um, let's suppose there was like a veil of ignorance where you didn't know what the species was and then when the creature was born you discovered that it actually wasn't a human creature that it was something else um, you might think oh well even though that something else might be able to flourish in its own terms we would often think of it as um, like a tragedy mm. uh, and the reason for that is because we would think well it, it might be able to flourish as some other sort of species but as a human it, it can't and so yeah I'm wondering what you would think about that kind of thought experiment so let me just clarify the thought experiment that uh, a woman gives birth to a severely handicapped no, no a radically alien yes oh good heavens um <laughs> it's not a it's not a possibility I I, I have uh, considered. I mean, with my, some would say, simplistic pleasure pain metric, this axis of, of good and bad, all my, uh, all my focus would be on how would the woman, how would her family, uh, family respond. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that re really would stretch my imagination. Mm -hmm. um, but no, in the case of humans, now imagine if. A human predator who preyed on young and vulnerable small children were to say that he is much more cognitively sophisticated and advanced. I mean, we wouldn't regard this as, as an acceptable uh, reason for, for for harming the the young, the innocent, and the vulnerable. And I think we should take this principle seriously rather than turn our values uh, on their head. Mm. I mean, obviously, phasing out predation is only one aspect of compassionate stewardship of nature. Mm. But what today is, you know, something like a zoo or a wildlife park will increasingly be, yeah, the, the, the rest of the rest of the living world. I, mean, I sometimes use the use the term high tech Jainism. We think of Jains brushing brushing the ground in front of them rather than. Uh, inadvertently tread on an insect. I would regard this as, uh, uh, yes, altruistic but ineffective altruism. Whereas, in principle, at any rate, we will, you know, effective altruism will be possible, uh, underwriting the all the well-being of all, all, all sentience. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, editing the genome. Um, unfortunately, it conjures up in many people's minds images of eugenics. Probably before most people are ready, to, ready for genome editing, we can have pre-implantation screening. But yes, in, in, in the long run, do you think we should be aiming to edit the genome, not presumably merely to make humans and non-human animals happier, but also so that we are predisposed to behave in ways that you would conceive of as virtuous? Yeah. Um I don't have any, um, you know, in principle objection to gene editing or genome editing, um, and if, uh, to some extent, that helped uh, us as humans be more virtuous, um, 
that sounds like a good idea in theory. I'd be wondering about the sort of you know, genetic influence on virtuous character traits. Um, but I'm willing to believe that there can be some influence there. So to the extent that it would help, um, yeah, I think it might be worth considering. And so I don't think there's any thing um, you know intrinsically valuable about the sort of an individual's genotype as such um, so I'm not opposed to things like gene therapy or you know like for that matter sort of mitochondrial DNA um, transplant okay so um well what about the scenario where uh, a specific scenario so in the future we live in the future where we're, we're trying to edit genomes and we've we've Okay, so for most of the children that come into the world, we have a, um, you know, a, a pretty good success rate of bringing happy, healthy, smart, strong, long-living children into the world. But once in a while, something goes wrong. Like, you know, uh, you have a child that um, has a throwback of some ancient ev evolutionary ancestor right? and, and um, you know, can't really, yeah, you just doesn't really behave like a human, doesn't look like, you know, a, a standard model of what a human looks like, and yeah. What happens then? Well, one of the arguments against germline editing is that by passing on this alteration to future generations, one is doing something irrevocable. But in practice, uh, genome editing even if the germline isn't irrevocable, uh, increasingly we will be able to edit and re-edit at will. Uh, yes, one can imagine all manner of pitfalls, missteps, you name it, things going wrong. But at least from a utilitarian perspective, the very nature of anything going wrong, I would argue, changes if there is not suffering involved. Um, suffering in the sense is relatively well uh, neurologically, anatomically uh, defined, whereas something like eudaimonia or the virtues, it's, it's, it's much less clear precisely what their, their neurological substrates uh, would be. They get sort of multiply instantiated. It's not as though one can code for courage for example mm, or mm. something like that no i think it's true mm. and i think it comes down to a basic difference between understanding eudaimonia or a good human life in terms of experiences alone um, and understanding it as something a bit more active and this is the more aristotelian idea of well-being i suppose that um you know, there are aspects of it which require, you know, the doing of something and being capable of doing those things and not only being able to have sort of good experiences. Um, so, you know, being able to, you know, complete a PhD thesis or being able to climb a mountain um, or, um, you know, being able to maintain a friendship, to use that example again, uh, which requires often helping them move house, perhaps, if you're a good friend. <laughs> um, so yeah, I suppose the kind of genetic basis for some of those things, if there is one, is much harder to pin down. Um, I've now learned how to pronounce, how, to, how is it, you, I, I've been, mis not that I've often used the I expression. I eudaimonia a bit. Like eudaimonia, how is it correctly pronounced? Well, I don't know if this is correct, but I've always <laughs> said eudaimonia. Eudaimonia, well yeah. it sounds, sufficiently alien for it probably to be correct one just needs to say it with confidence <laughs> yeah so i mean well, i mean what aspects of human enhancement since we're on the topic do you think we'd be able to approach with virtue ethics which couldn't be approached with from a utilitarian framework i think enhancing those more active uh, components of uh, different virtues and the different ingredients of a flourishing life, a uh, life of eudaimonia. Um, I think it's fairly difficult for a, like a classical utilitarian, a classical hedonistic utilitarian maybe to capture perhaps fully the different um, ingredients, if you like, of those, those goods. Um, so, you know, obviously 
there have been attempts by utilitarians over the years to try to accommodate that. For example, you know, Sidgwick talked a lot about um, why certain virtuous character traits are useful. And so, you know, one of his arguments was that, you know, in certain circumstances, you don't have a lot, a lot of time to think before acting and that it's good to have developed habits of deliberation, habits of acting that are beneficial and some virtues can serve that purpose very well. Um, you know, bear in mind that even though I think of virtues as intrinsically valuable, I don't think that they're absolutely valuable. So I think they have to be justified by uh, showing how they do help us to flourish as humans. So if it turned out that something that we regarded now as virtuous um, didn't help us flourish as humans, then I don't think we should call that character trait a virtue anymore. That's interesting. Have you got any, any symptoms? Yes, I, okay, part of me struggles with the notion of, of virtue because one can imagine alien civilizations with an entirely different set of virtues, whereas I, I think one would find it very difficult to imagine an alien civilization with an inverted pleasure pain axis. In, in some sense, for reasons we don't understand, uh, the pleasure pain axis, I would say, discloses the world's inbuilt metric of value and the kinds of things I personally would regard as virtuous and virtuous behavior and I would strive, strive for Ultimately, I suspect it's, it's, it's derivative, that one doesn't want to over-fetishize one's own conception of the virtuous. I mean, you know, traditionally something like heterosexual marriage, if one is heterosexual and one's conception of the good life is man and a woman flourishing, then, you know, one responds perhaps in a, in a visceral way to the idea of two people of the same gen gender. And if one, so far as one trusts, trusts the wisdom of disgust and so on, if that, that is the way one feels, then one feels it's, 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 it's not virtuous, but ultimately it's just a fetish. And stripped of any kind of sexual association, I worry that many of uh, the, uh, what I would think of as, yeah, uh, virtuous characteristics are ultimately no more than fetishes. Um, yeah, I tend to th think um, that you know, true virtues and true external goods like friendship are kind of cross-cultural and although there might be some you know, cultural variation in um, how friendship is uh, practiced, I, I think that uh, there's a core set of um, practices and you know, beliefs and values that are you know, common to really any relationship that claims to count as a friendship. And so too for virtues and virtuous character traits that, um, uh, you know, as I was saying before, I think ultimately they're tied to our flourishing as human beings. And so, uh, you know, to use David's example, um, people who say that humans can only flourish in a heterosexual relationship, I think, are making a mistake about what counts as flourishing for, for humans. Um, but I think there is going to be this difference between us uh, about... Um, you know, thinking of sort of pleasure and pain as something that is not only a sort of more objective cross-cultural um, indicator of um, maybe what a good life is or what's good, but also, you know, cross-species as well. And so for me, I'm always wanting to um, look at uh, goods that are a little more concrete than that. And as soon as you do that, as soon as you move from something slightly more abstract to something a little more concrete, you know, you'll get some variations. And I think, I agree, this is a challenge, I think, for virtue ethics to try to explain, well, how much variation ought we to, you know, tolerate in the sense of um, still count as important for a good life um, or, you know, for the good. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. It's, it, once you start looking at, like, real um, implementation details and yeah, you may get quite some differences there but the idea of having like if, if we understood enough about what the what valence came down to what the pleasure and pain axis really was um, whether it was a, a common property amongst all animals and all possible life then that would be quite useful in determining how we should evolve as a species if we're going to keep, take control of our own evolution. Mm, for mm. sure. So, just wondering, I'm trying to think, well, I mean, 
how, yes, do, yes, ha yes. how to characterize the idea, this ideal, that seems to be quite virtuous yet also utilitarian, that we should be focusing on making people flourish and have lots of joy in their life, but also focus on reducing and ultimately phasing out suffering. Um, these could be framed as, as virtues, um, especially in lieu of not really understanding the diet, like uh, having a, um, a, a full physical proof of uh, an account for a, a, an argument for this. You know, one argument against <coughs> classical utilitarianism uh, is that, in a sense, we can't stop that however wonderful and marvellous a civilization is. Let's, let's suppose we do have a civilization uh, in which we are animated by gradients of intelligent bliss. If we are strict classical utilitarians, ultimately we must be aiming to, in, to, to optimize matter and energy into pure orgasmic bliss. Right? It's uh, the, the, what is generally regarded as a reductio ad absurdum of negative utilitarianism is this, is this idea that if all that matters is getting rid of suffering, shouldn't we aim to just painlessly sterilise the planet? Um, but classical utilitarianism taken literally too seems to have equally apocalyptic consequences and that from the from the negative utilitarian perspective once one has phased out the biology of suffering one's obligations are discharged but no such uh, relaxation is, is is open for the classical utilitarian the, the classical utilitarian as long as there is any matter and energy that is not optimized for pure bliss must apparently keep on stri <laughs> striving um, yeah i think that is I agree, a difficulty for a classical hedonistic utilitarian too. Have you seen it discussed in the academic literature? Because the academic literature, as far as I can tell, is focused on homely dilemmas such as, as the trolley problem, mm. not utilitronium shockwaves. Mm, no, no. Yeah, so. I, actually Roger Crisp has an article about, um, he calls it I think global utilitarianism, um, which mm. is uh, about a 1992 article where he, he, he doesn't talk about those examples exactly mm. but it is thinking about it more as just a state of the world the welfare mm. of the world as a totality yeah um, so that's and I, I think he gives some good arguments in you know in defense of that um, what, one of the things I wanted to say about it too just coming back to virtue ethics a little bit more was a sort of further thought that might be developed because of course Aristotle thought that exercising the virtues was is supposed to be pleasurable you know, it's um, a form of pleasure, and if you're not experiencing pleasure when you're acting courageously and compassionately and, and so on, then you haven't really got the virtue yet. But of course, you know, for Aristotle, it's not just that you experience pleasure, but it's taking pleasure in the right things, the right objects and so on at the right times. And so, we, you know, if we're thinking about trying to increase pleasure in the world, we'd want to, presumably from a virtue ethics point of view, make sure that it's well directed and well targeted um, because otherwise you know say in the example of courage you know you'd want the courageous person to feel pleasure at not so much this sort of looking in the mirror oh aren't I a courageous person but more mm. thinking about that um, you know you have helped to promote some good thing some sort of just cause for example um, so that would be it's being I don't know if this is the right term but being more discerning about what one takes pleasure in when one is acting virtuously that would also be important. Yes, it was said of uh, Madame de Stael that she would throw all her friends in the water for the pleasure of fishing them out again. Uh, one needs to be careful when, it, when so many of the traditional horrors of Darwinian life become optional. Should we uh, aim to preserve them so that other folk can exercise the traditional virtues of character? Uh, <laughs> I, I would possibly this is a reflection of my own personality, much rather have uh, a, a, an idyllic utopian society in which, you know, the awful nastiness of, of Darwinian life just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. I'm so used to thinking that um, obstacles and um, setbacks and um, you know, losing friends and so on are part of human life that one mm. needs to develop um, appropriate responses to those things. and. Um,
that um, you could think of these intrinsic goods as having as being good in certain circumstances. That doesn't mean that we should just do anything in order to promote courage or compassion. I mean, there's been interesting kind of backlash against virtue ethics starting to come out um, in bioethics and uh, in healthcare practice, where you know some people are arguing that uh, you know these days a lot of students are being encouraged to be more virtuous and more courageous and that this somehow panders to healthcare administrators becoming complacent about fixing up systemic problems, trying to reduce adverse events because they can just think, oh, well, we needn't worry about that so much anymore because we've got this whole army of recent medical graduates who are now much more courageous. Mm. They'll just speak up as whistleblowers and we can rely on them. And, and, and part of that same sort of critique is saying, well, you know, should we just leave adverse events in place as an opportunity for the medical students to learn how to be more courageous in reporting them? And yeah, to me that sort of, I'm not saying you're arguing this, no, no, but, yeah, yeah. but to me that mm. critique really misunderstands the value of courage. It's sort of has a conditional value in the sense it's, it's intrinsically good, but it's good in certain circumstances. So when, um, if you like, you know, serving the good um, requires speaking up in a way that overcomes fear, um, that's something that you are disposed to do, but not at any cost whatsoever. And, not, and it shouldn't be promoted uh, just through any old means. Um. Yes, I suspect your conception of humanity and life is rosier than mine. I confess I have a very dark conception of the nature of, of all life, uh, including human life. Uh, I'm in some ways quite sim sympathetic to David Benatar, better never to have been, <laughs> that we are creatures that ought not to exist. Um, the big difference I would uh, draw attention to is that, uh, that David Benatar, as you probably know, urges that uh, we should engineer human extinction via voluntary childlessness, which uh, simply ignores the argument from selection pressure. Uh, but as uh, I said, I think that we should be using uh, the new bi biotechnology to, uh, yes, uh, engineer beings uh, who, when they come into existence, are not intrinsically harmed. Uh, and uh, yes, Okay, I, I think we should abolish all experience below hedonic zero, but it will also be possible to create life, children, grandchildren, who are virtuous, far more virtuous than humans are capable of being, even by today's criteria of virtue. Mm -hmm. I mean, if one could create super virtuous beings, mm -hmm. do you think one should do so, or should we aim to continue to uh, uh, create monstrously flawed creatures like we are today? It's mm. an interesting um, question. Um, I would probably need to know a little bit more about the kind of species question of the super virtuous, um, mm -hmm. but presuming they were still human beings in mm -hmm. some sense. Um, I don't see why we shouldn't create, um, try to create individuals who could more easily be virtuous. Um, I, you know, I sort of, I guess I think of becoming more virtuous as something that tends to require more effort and choice. And so, uh, you know, in, in, some, in the case of some virtues, there might be even a sort of conceptual difficulty with thinking that one is more virtuous when one hasn't had to choose to do it, given that virtues are meant to be an exercise of practical wisdom um, in each case. But yeah, in, in theory, I guess I don't have any big objection to what you've proposed, but I find it hard to, hard to imagine what that would amount to in reality. Each form of ethic, whether it be virtue, utilitarian, or even deontological, seems to have their own um, repugnant conclusions and their own reductio ad absurdum. So can reductio ad absurdum ad absurdums be trusted if what becomes practically feasible changes uh, when we progress technologically and uh, all forms of uh, manipulating the physical uh, world uh, today become more possible? 
Um, yeah, I, I think that we shouldn't just um, completely rely on intuition and what we find counterintuitive and repugnant now when we try to work out um, what's good and what's right. Um, I think intuitions can play a useful role um, in ethical argument and uh, we need to be wary of when we are just uh, you know, reinforcing an unjustified sort of prejudice about um, you know, against forms of life or against ways of living for humans that actually could be you know, beneficial. Um, and you know, I think o often we are rather limited in being able to conceptualise some of the more sort of radical possibilities that are suggested by you know, transhumanists, various sorts of various forms of you know, transhumanism. Um, so yeah, I, I, I guess I don't want to discard intuition altogether and you know, repugnant conclusions as sort of teaching us something about the human condition. But um, as you, yeah, as I think you were suggesting there, you know, Adam, that um, you know, every ethical theory is going to have its own repugnant conclusions and we need to uh, be fair in ethical argument <clears throat> about um, you know, which conclusions are more repugnant to us now than, you know, than others. I, th I think you know, one of the things that struck me too in you know, reading um, Aristotle's ethics after all these years um, of it being published and um, being spoken is just how much of it still rings true uh, now in terms of what's valuable for humans and um, so that gives me hope that m maybe when we think of our intuitive responses now we mightn't be completely on the wrong track but sometimes it's hard to know which intuitions to sort of prioritise. Yeah, I suppose I deeply, deeply uh, distrust intuition. I mean, why does one have the particular strong ethical intuitions one does? Uh, evolutionary biology would explain our most profound uh, uh, intuitions about the good life or what's, what's right and what's wrong uh, in, in, in genetic terms, that such impulses helped uh, our ancestors leave more copies of themselves uh, on the African savanna. Um, so, yes, uh, it's regarded as respectable in philosophy to say intuitively this, intuitively that, counterintuitively. Why should intuition count more in ethics than it does in physics or any of the other, uh, uh, any of the special sciences? Uh, that said, to understand a particular ethical position, I think one, yeah, one should explore its extreme inverted commas uh, implications. And I, I wonder how many classical utilitarians would still espouse classical utilitarians if they had thought through the implications of we should convert masculine energy uh, in, in, into utilitronium. Um. Just uh, one more point. Um, what is the scope for compromise? Uh, insofar as ethics is about uh, practical decisions rather than uh, the, the mere theory, philosophers sitting in a relaxed environment uh, uh, chewing the cud. Uh, if we are trying to work out practical policies, I think we should be looking uh, to make yeah, uh, uh, compromises and uh, as someone who hopes that we can use the new technology to phase out involuntary suffering, I would be looking not to, not to urge negative utilitarianism, but rather to reach out to, uh, to religious people, to deontologists, to virtue ethicists, to preference utilitarians and say, it, isn't there some way that your worries and concerns can be accommodated? Wouldn't it be good if our long-term goal as a species were to phase out involuntary suffering? Uh, is there some kind of you know, Apollo project that we can uh, 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 agree on? Yeah, I think um, it's important to look at what common ground there might be between different ethicists and, you know, Derek Harford's idea that we're all climb climbing the same mountain from different sides. And um, al although I think one can easily overestimate the amount of moral convergence you get between the different approaches, I, I think, um, you know, as also Rosalind Hursthouse has argued that, you know, 
in philosophy and ethics people can be unnecessarily combative and um, there's much to be gained by looking at the common ground um, that you might find from a range of approaches. Yes, to me the repugnant, the really repugnant conclusion of negative utilitarianism isn't it would be better to switch reality off if it meant the end of some of the unspeakable suffering exists, rather it's some version of the pinprick argument that if one, you know, one imagines a wonderful flourishing civilization, is a, pin, a mere pinprick enough to justify uh, uh, switching it off. Um, though I was decrying just now the role of intuition, my own intuitions rebel at such an absurd, <laughs> uh, uh, absurd idea. Mm, um, mm, me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but even people who regard the idea of switching off a world that contains today's unspeakable suffering as absurd will often pause if you rejig the experiment. So as well as a delete button, there is also copy, a copy button whereby you can press this copy button and create a type identical world. Yes, with all of today's joys, but also all of today's horrors. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've never actually uh, seen any study done, but perhaps only a bare majority of people would actually press the copy button and take responsibility for creating so much suffering. Mm, uh, would mm. if, no, uh, perhaps I should ask you the question, uh, I, I certainly know you wouldn't press the off button, but if there were also a copy button, would you create a type identical version of our world? No, I don't think so. I think because of the sort of evil actions and um, some of the suffering that, mm. that um, humans um, inflict on each other, no, I don't think we should deliberately create an identical copy of the world as it is now. Right, that's, oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah. So to what extent is our commitment to preserving the world or approximation of the world as it exists today a reflection of status quo bias? <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> I'm also very wary of status quo bias yeah. and um, it's a very difficult thing to guard against because often it's unconscious, as, as we know. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I don't know, in, you know, in my own case, how much of my answer to the question you posed before about creating another copy of the world as it is now um, and my aversion to doing that is, um, you know, presumably that couldn't be a, an expression of status quo bias because it's saying, no, no, we, we shouldn't preserve the status quo as it is mm. um, but but I know when people react intuitively to various scenarios um, you know, futuristic scenarios that, that and um, express repugnance that it can well be an expression of status quo bias and, uh, amongst the many other biases that we humans are subject to I think unconsciously for that matter mm. One thing I find troubling is the extent to which one's whole conception of life, the universe, everything in the future is some form of disguised autobiography and if one knows more about the lives and the backgrounds and the experiences and guiding narratives of different futures and ethicists, so much is traced to their own personalities Yes. and rather than this being a criticism of them, someone could quite fairly point to the fact that in my own life, well, I'm certainly much more sensitive to punishment than reward, and that if I were subjected to large quantities of, un you know, uh, unspeakable bliss and so on, I might well rapidly shed my classical utilita uh, negative utilitarianism and decide it was all worthwhile <laughs> to Jenny. You know, uh, I, I know it is interesting to reflect yeah. on the connections between a particular philosopher's theory and worldview mm. and their own life experiences. I think mm. there's often a lot to be learned in that regard. There's certainly many stories I could tell about that sort of thing <laughs> with the philosophers that I've known over the years. <laughs> yeah. Of course, I mean, in the case of a physicist, if you if you subsequently learn he was really a monster of hypocrisy and goodness knows what else, doesn't invalidate his theories. But mm. in the case in the case of ethicists, nonetheless, if you know someone 
doesn't live up to their ideals or in, indeed even is a refutation their life seems to be a refutation of their ideals does it detract from the excellence or otherwise of of their ideals i don't know well, i think for a virtue ethicist it would yes this is uh <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not so clear that for a utilitarian that it, no, it would yes. in the same way, but I think oh. it sort of typically does and mm. the way that so many people admire Peter Singer because he tries to practice what he preaches, you know, so yeah. much. Um, and there's other utilitarians also, of course, attempt to do that. Mm. Um, I mean, it's, you know, both theories are you know, very demanding in their own ways, so yeah. it's especially impressive in either case when you get someone who really does attempt to live that, that theory and you get to see as an observer almost maybe what some of the advantages but also some of the sort of challenges of um, trying to implement the theory really are when you see them, uh, a person attempting to implement it in their own lives. Yes, I mean, I'm personally a great admirer, long been a great admirer of Peter Singer but I think it's perhaps harder for uh, uh, people who let's say are giving a percentage of their income to charity and there's going to be no spotlight upon them I know personally that I can be very virtuous if I know people are watching and even more virtuous if they don't realize that I know that they're watching but uh, I certainly couldn't manage you know I know that I do know some people who uh, yeah give 50 percent of their income to charity um so yeah how could utilitarians and virtue ethicists for example work well together well, I think one of the ways is through um, you know, virtue ethicists learning about being more effective altruists. I think the sort of evidence-based approach to effective altruism that you know, some utilitarians advocate is very helpful. Um, I don't think that virtue ethicists would take quite a maximising approach that some but not all utilitarians would take, but I think it's an excellent idea to you know, require more evidence of how one's exercise of the virtue of generosity and liberality is actually impacting upon the world. Um, so that's one area of overlap, perhaps. Virtues seem to often be hard to quantify. Can virtues be quantified? To what extent? If, if, if to what extent that they can't, how can we measure progress in, in virtue? Yeah, I think it's important in trying to measure progress in virtue that we don't set the bar too high in terms of what counts as evidence. Um, so, you know, I think we, um, in trying to inculcate, for example, courage in, let's say, you know, doctors and medical students to report on um, the unethical behaviour of colleagues, uh, you know, I think that one thing that can help there is if they have a more experiential understanding of what it's like to be a whistleblower. Um, and so, you know, one way to try to sort of measure the impact of that is, I suppose, behaviourally, to see how students cope in those role-playing kind of scenarios. Um, but, you know, it's very difficult to know what's going on in their minds when they're doing it. So. Um, you know, I think the behavioural indicators are pretty inexact as an indication of virtue. There's a lot of um, attempts uh, now, uh, at least in you know, the teaching of medical ethics, to try to help students combat what's known as the hidden curriculum, so unethical environments, where often doctors who graduate get exposed to negative role models of other doctors who think that you know, ethics is a waste of time because there's no right answers or we're just too busy. So I think there are ways of trying to better equip students to be able to be more kind of resilient ethically in those environments. Uh, again, it's a behavioural measure, and I think looking at the, ad the sort of attitudinal measures of virtue is more difficult. Um, but there are a lot of attempts now uh, around the world of people trying to, if you like, operationalise the teaching of virtue and trying to become better at actually being able to measure it. Um, um, I'm not an expert in those sort of measurement attempts, but I think that you know they're really crucial and they're really important for understanding how realistic the prescriptions of virtue ethicists actually are.
Yes, I mean, when one has more than one ethical principle, there are always going to be occasions, at least in theory and quite often in practice, where virtues conflict. Uh, do you believe there is some kind of meta-virtue or ethic? For example, friendship uh, and loyalty may conflict with one's obligation to report on a colleague who is behaving in a way that you regard as unethical. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do think that um, there's at least a meta virtue in the sense of practical wisdom, phrenesis as Aristotle called it. And um, in that sort of scenario, I think that the intrinsic good of friendship ought to um, you know, give way to, if it's a professional context, serving the proper goals of the profession. And so if a colleague appeals to you out of friendship not to report on them, not to be a whistleblower, why not say, well, I'm sorry, I cannot with my doctor's hat on do that. I, I, I'm here. I've got a particular brief that society has given me, and um, you know you can't require that of me in the name of friendship uh, because I'm here as a doctor. Um, I, I think you know one of the things about um, intrinsic value that's kind of interesting here, and intrinsic goods is that um, you know I don't think that to, that there's one kind of model or one recipe of living. Mm. Um, a flourishing life in great detail. I think although there are core goods and virtues, I think that it can be accentuated. Um, one virtue or one intrinsic good can be accentuated maybe more than another. And so, for example, one could think of um, parenthood as intrinsically valuable. One can also think of artistic accomplishment as intrinsically valuable. Um, but one shouldn't think that people who um, can't become parents, can't have children, therefore can't flourish. Just as we wouldn't think that, you know, someone who cannot be a successful artist can't flourish. So I don't think that a life, um, a flourishing life needs to have all the intrinsic goods that there are. I think of it more um, on the model of there being a core and you could um, sort of pull it a little bit one way towards parenthood or pull it a little bit another way towards artistic accomplishment and each of them might be perhaps flourishing equally. So, I mean, to what extent can utilitarian uh, goals be measured? Well, well, I think in principle one can measure pleasure and pain. Uh, crudely one can operationalize them in non-human animals and very young humans and other subjects that aren't verbally competent by seeing how hard the organism will work to obtain or avoid a particular stimulus and it seems that the objective behavioral criteria overlap very tightly with neuroscanning or in the case of let's say administering various euphoriant or dysphoriant drugs uh, down at the molecular level um, but whereas one can quantify at least in principle pleasure and pain the very notion of quantifying and I'm mispronouncing it eudaimonia uh, <laughs> I, is much much more problematic I'm not clear if it, if it can be done hmm. One way of trying to operationalise it would be through the capabilities approach to well-being and trying to measure how much someone is able to uh, have, you know, what Martha Nussbaum and Amartya Sen call the central human capabilities in their lives. Um, you know, that's a sort of rough indicator of whether someone has some of the key ingredients of living a flourishing life for humans. Okay, so here's an interesting question. To what extent can you then say that science um, informs virtue? Uh, <clears throat> what it, what, what's your response to the is-ought uh, debate? Yes. Well, I think that um, science is very important for understanding virtue. And I think, for example, neuroscience is um, can be very illuminating about um, the way that our brains work um, when people are sort of acting virtuously and um, you know the is ought question yeah I agree with Hume that you can't just deduce an ought from an is but I also think that um, we can reach and sort of inductive um, you know inductively supported conclusion about what is a good life for humans through looking at 
the way different human communities have flourished. So, yeah, I don't think one should have some theory of flourishing that's in abstraction from the way that, you know, human communities have themselves flourished. And so, you know, there have been ideas of flourishing in the past, uh, which have been, I would say, problematic. And, you know, one of the big challenges for virtue ethics is, I think, especially the Aristotelian variety of it, that um, trying, to, trying to see whether or not the virtue of justice is something that would lead, that would underpin a principle of sort of egalitarianism or giving people an equal opportunity to flourish. And um, I think in some communities in the past that have been very hierarchical, that perhaps Aristotle himself might have even said, that people are flourishing, I would suggest that, that you know, that's a mistake, that there, there, there needs to, that humans, all humans need to be given an equal opportunity to develop the virtues and live flourishing lives. And I think you can find some textual support for that in Aristotle's work with politics, um, but it's not the traditional interpretation of his work on politics. No, I feel our genes didn't design us to flourish. Our genes designed us to be discontented a lot of the time and that if we were genetically identical clones, yes, then perhaps our mode of flourishing would be different. But uh, no, uh, mothers, the, their genetic interests will conflict sometimes with their children. Men and women, people of different ages, uh, conflict uh, discontent, unhappiness, it's built into what it means to be human and I think science can inform ethics insofar as that now we have got, at least potentially within our grasp mastery of our genetic source code, that we can start purging our, our genes of these tremendously sinister elements that cause us to behave in ways that induce so much suffering. Do you think there there are clear biological roots to to virtues, um, and you, do you think you'd be able to quantify virtue through neuroscience and, and biological aspects without even looking at the the um, the cultural and community level uh, abstractions? Um, yeah, I think that when it comes to something like the drive to understand the world. Uh, it's something that you see in very young children, um, that inquisitiveness and you know curiosity about the world. Um, I, d I don't know much about the biological basis of that. Um, you know, I make similar points again about friendship, which I don't think of as itself a virtue, but as um, a necessary external good part of a flourishing life. And I think that humans are, if you like, naturally social creatures. Um, I'm not quite sure of the biological basis for that either if, to the extent that there is one but I think it it could be quite illuminating to you know discover well why you know to what extent are we so to speak hardwired to be social creatures and what sorts of sociality what sort of relationships are ones that are consistent with that and or you know whether indeed Kant is right which I think he's not in thinking that you know true friendship is something that you'll never find anywhere in the world because um Friends are all too ready to, you know, secretly rejoice in each other's failings. Um, So-called friends. And or is it Gorvidal? Every time a friend succeeds, part of me dies, or, or something like that. That's an ex an extreme example. Though, of course, humans are designed to be social. We're not designed to be loving, empathetic, warm, as though we were at a, an MDMA-driven rave. Uh, and if I have a notion, personal notion, of what ideal social life would be like, it would more resemble the effects of MDMA, in which everyone loves everyone, and one has a sense that the world loves you, rather than the nature of Darwinian friendship, which, amongst males, it's often a case of of shared alliances. Think back to the African African savanna rather than uh, unconditional love and warmth.
I'm sounding as though I'm more of temperamentally some kind of a hippie chimp or a bonobo. Sadly, I, <laughs> sadly I'm not. But uh, many years ago, in my early youth, I have uh, experienced the uh, uh, effects of something like MDMA. And yes, clearly the nature of social life would be radically different if we were in such states all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's both an inner and an outer dimension to virtue. And although I do think that, you know, um, actions speak louder than words and that in the end that's what we need to be thinking about as someone's actions, um, I think the inner dimension to one's actions, the reasons why one acts, the values one expresses um, in acting are really crucial. So, um, you know, we were talking earlier on about people in the Milgram experiments and the different things that were going on in the minds of the subjects who gave what they some of them thought were or might have been 450 volts to this learner I think to truly understand whether they were acting in ways that were evil or not virtuous we need to really have a good idea of what they were thinking and whether for example they did believe that the shock machine was real or whether they thought it was a fake or had an inkling of that at least. I think if one is a virtue ethicist, one presumably has some sort of notion as to how one ought to behave. Whereas if one is a classical or a negative utilitarian, given the immense uncertainties of the effect of, you know, uh, uh, there is no felicific calculus one can dust down and, and do. Yeah, the, uh, the possibility that one can simply be uh, uh, mistaken in, in much, much of one's actions uh, is, 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 is a live one. Uh, yeah. mm. So uh, if I call myself a utilitarian, but actually day to day I'm making decisions not fully calculated yet. <laughs> Um, does, uh, but usually, I guess, more informed what I think is uh, like by, by good habits and, and um, you know, obeying rules. Uh, then I can, uh, I should say that in practice, I'm a virtue deontologist with a, like, you know, a smattering of utilitarians. <laughs> That's a good sentence. <laughs> <laughs> How well integrated is uh, academic philosophy into the local community would you say here because uh, obviously traditionally analytic philosophy very specialized and technical and completely alien I just wondered in terms of do you have much contact with local community here or, yeah yeah, yeah there's yeah. all kinds of um, mm. things uh, often they're called outreach which is mm. maybe not the best term but outreach activities so mm. there's this um, thing called heart of philosophy it's a, a series of philosophy cafes that um, have been running for years around Melbourne I've done a number of those lots of my colleagues have done those mm. pubs and I mean cafes it doesn't have to be an actual cafe serving coffee but um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of that and I suppose because I work in a bioethics centre there's often you'll do you know ward rounds or grand rounds and give a talk at a right. hospital um, but actual yeah apart from the philosophy cafes I, th I think yeah it's sort of connected with what I was saying before that, that, that Australians often you know there's not quite the sort of diversification or people tend to be a bit more uh, sort of jacks of all trades not, yeah. not necessarily master of none but they'll do a bit of theory mm. and a bit of practice as well so yeah. I, I think certainly amongst colleagues I've had over the years a lot of them have this sort of commitment to making sure that the philosophy they do is not just an academic thing an ivory tower and you know doing a lot of sort of community work or um you know, sometimes, of course, through the media, because media are really interested in sort of bioethical issues, but also just doing talks for small groups. I mean, if people ask me to come and give a talk somewhere about issues in ethics, bioethics, if I've got the time, I'll normally say yes. Mm -hmm. So I've done a lot of that um, sort of community service work or whatever over the years. Um, but I think, yeah, amongst colleagues I've had, there is that sense that it's part of your role as an academic to right, yes. do that kind of outreach. Mm. Um, how big is your administrative burden? Because I don't know how much time that leaves you to write and do your own research and how much is caught up with it, it admin stuff. Uh, it's quite significant, um, especially when I was Senate director for 13 years. Mm. Um, it just increased, even though we're only a small centre. Um, at the moment, I, I wouldn't say that it's sort of paralysing or, you know, overwhelming. Um, but 
yeah, it's certainly grown over the you know, yeah. 25 years <laughs> I've been in academia. <laughs> Yeah, there's always a danger if you're working outside academia that you tend to sort of drift off into outer space. Um, mm -hmm. But equally, of course, one doesn't have the uh, administrative burdens that presumably... Yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, One thing I could email you if you're interested is mm. um, last year um, there was a book on the history of philosophy in Australia and New Zealand published and I was asked to write a chapter on the history of moral philosophy in Australia and New Zealand, which it's about right. 15,000 words. That would be very interesting, I thought yes. it was a PDF, so I can mm. just email it to you. Because yeah. I know more about, I mean, I associate kind of uh, Australian materialism and the kind of philosophy of yeah. mind and metaphysics, which uh, exactly. is very, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what I it's known for. I, less, I know less about the history of moral philosophy. Yeah, 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 no, there's a lot. It's yeah. actually, yeah, quite interesting. One of the interesting things, too, this is, um, mm. this is not so much about Australasian philosophers getting out into the community, but one of the, um, it's just a footnote in this article I mentioned to mm. you on the history of moral philosophy, is that um, in the late 1850s at Rugby School, you know, when Henry Sidgwick was mm -hmm. there as a student, um, a fellow student of his in the very same class was Tom Wills, who was, uh, is known here as the founder of Australian Rules Football. And so um, people often say that Tom Wills blended the uh, rules of Man Grook, which is a sort of Aboriginal football, with the rules of rugby. <laughs> and I've long been curious to know whether or not Tom Wills talked to Henry Sidgwick about the rules that he was uh, coming up with for Australian football. But uh, I don't know. Uh, there's a couple of people I know who are looking into this in a bit more detail, but it's just <laughs> odd to think that we've got this game here in Australia, which is um, not played in you know, many other places. Um, and it was formed at the time that Wills was studying with one of the most famous utilitarians that philosophy has known. So I've got no idea whether there's any link. I've mentioned this to Peter Singer, I've mentioned it to Roger Crisp and a bunch of other people. and. Someone needs to go to rugby school and look in the archives and see whether they were friends and kept up contact after they graduated.